Chapter 4 The Edge of Time One day, as Jesus sat with an intimate circle of his disciples, they began to ask about things to come. Man has long sought to pull back the curtain of tomorrow, and those close to Jesus felt at liberty to query him about the future. Like the disciples of old, we will look to the only accurate source of information about our future. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 It's where men turn for their information that counts. People lose millions of dollars acting on tips from undependable sources about the future in the stock market and horse races. Faulty information can cause great loss, just as courts of law always gauge the reliability of evidence, so must we be sure of the trustworthiness of our millennial information because our destiny hinges on it. Millions of marriages have been destroyed by sheer gossip. Bloody wars have exploded when momentous decisions were made on faulty intelligence. For Christians, it is a life or death matter that we heed the word of God in our own life decisions. Millions are spent trying to look into the future through wrong means, such as the occult. Pharaoh wasn't the only politician who staffed this court with seers. Several present-day leaders have been known to employ occult means in their governing processes. Some heads of corporations think it's fashionable to inquire of fortune tellers to assist in their decision making. Hundreds of thousands consult their horoscopes in daily newspapers and call 1-900 psychic lines each day. The consequences to humanity from these occult practices are often mental illness, bondage, and even suicide. Dabbling in tomorrow can be a risky business for the universe. Present-day fascination with the occult stems from man's quest to know future events before they happen. Being the arch opportunist, Satan has played on this curiosity for thousands of years. The Tower of Babel was used for ancient astrological efforts. For this abomination, God fragmented humanity by confounding its speech. See Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9. In view of all this wreckage caused by seeking knowledge of the future from forbidden sources, you would think man would wise up. But don't hold your breath. King Saul couldn't wait to find out how the war he was fighting would turn out. During the night, he stole out of camp to ask the witch of Endor. Saul got an answer all right, along with the occult revelation. The prophet Samuel revealed to Saul that he was under severe judgment. The very next day, a decapitated Saul hung by his heels, twirling in the sun. See 1 Samuel chapter 28 verses 7 through 19. How foolish is mankind! When will we acknowledge the Bible as the perfect fortune-telling book? Does that shock you? Well, the semantics might shake us up, but let's face it, the Bible is the one and only dependable look into the future. With just this book, any sincere person can accurately learn his own destiny, good or bad. It does not reveal just a few irrelevant tidbits from some fake crystal ball gazer, nor does it give a just a few bones from a seance. The Bible reveals mankind's entire panoramic future. But why trust that book? The Bible has taken more ridicule from the academic world than any book in history. It has been called sheer mythology, inaccurate and even foolish. But its message has proven indestructible. The more it's attacked, the brighter it shines. It contains hundreds of insights to history written before the events took place. Nearly one-fifth of this book is prophetic. The Bible authenticates itself. Archaeologists have been utterly astounded recently by the accuracy of its record of past civilizations. Modern scholars acknowledge that it has often been ahead of science. Back when men were saying that the world was flat, the Bible said, It is he, God, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. The Bible's history written in advance has awed godly scholars by its perfect batting average. Most of the prophecies about men, 
cities and nations have already come to pass exactly how and precisely when the Bible said they would. These events have marched right out of prophecy and into our history books. This majestic parade of prophetic fulfillment proves that humanity lives under divine management. Yes, the Bible is an accurate book of fortune. So let's find out about our own future and the one who controls that future. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Jesus foretold the circumstances we now see all about us. As we read the Bible's account of our day, it's like reading Time magazine. He wanted his followers to know when civilization had arrived at the edge of time. We are the generation about whom Jesus said, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Luke chapter 21 verse 28. Before we travel into the world of the future, let's synchronize our watches with the great clock in heaven. It's not easy to believe we're standing at the end of this age. Everything looks as though it will go on and on. Though our world is experiencing wars, crises, and discouragement, we're still getting along pretty well. We're still building, buying, and marrying. Some say, hasn't the world always had problems? Jesus said there would be those who wouldn't believe the end was near. But Christians can see these things through spiritual eyes. Charles Duncan wrote in Christ for the Nations magazine, the signs of history's approaching climax are multiplying. A few years ago, those of the Academy predicted that the salvation of the human race would soon be achieved through the magic of man's mind. Their prophecies of utopia have faded. Their bright pictures have been darkened by the clouds of pessimism and what one writer called irritated futility. Each year closes with the usual parties, fireworks, whistles, and bell ringing, but they sound out over our cities crippled with brownouts and fuel shortages and sicken with crime. For the Christian, however, one magnificent and radiant star shines in the dark sky. He knows that these world pains are the birth pangs of a brand new age, which is about to be born. The hands once nailed to a cross are about to seize the reign of human government. We are now praying with added excitement, Thy kingdom come. Jesus told us how our present generation would face conditions similar to those that occurred before the great flood. God, through Noah, had warned a sin-mad people. For years, Noah urged the people to believe God and escape the coming judgment. He pleaded with them to heed the word of compassionate God, who desired that they repent and thereby survive the coming deluge. But they scoffed, branding old Noah a doomsday crackpot. They blew him off as a religious fanatic. The pre-flood philosophers, like many today, assure the people they needn't lose sleep over Noah's doomsday warnings. They went on doing their own thing up to the first ominous drops of rain. Here we go again at the turn of the century. The Lord has prepared the Ark of Salvation. He is calling Earth's people to enter in through His Son, Jesus Christ, the captain of the SS Salvation. Who will listen this time? Many more, I trust. But again, millions are laughing at God's present-day Noahs. Tomorrow's paper. Let's breeze through a few present clues that may help us see how close time has skidded to the edge and therefore rejoice at the nearness of golden millennium. The Genius Club. The membership of the Club of Rome consists of some of the world's distinguished thinkers and experts from many fields. Recently, the COR undertook a penetrating study of mankind's odds for survival in view of five global threats, runaway population, environmental poisoning, and depletion of energy, raw materials, and food. After inserting all exponential growth data on these into a computer, the COR experts concluded that Earth simply couldn't support its projected life in the near future. It shook the genius club. Zero population growth. There are new, unprecedented trends in humanity. Could the recent slowdown in baby production be another edge of time indicator? In the 6,000 years since God said be fruitful and multiply, Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, there has been an acceleration of births. But now, many first world nations are approaching zero population growth. Statisticians say that within a matter of years, there will be only one child to every four adults. 
Could this reduction in the number of babies be related to future world carnage? Innocent children would suffer horribly in the coming Armageddon. It's a thought. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Convulsive Crisis Economist Robert Hale Broner wrote an outstanding book entitled An Inquiry into the Human Prospect. He writes, The outlook for man is painful, difficult, perhaps desperate. The answer to whether we can conceive of the future other than as a continuation of the darkness, cruelty, and disorder of the past seems to me to be no. Hale Bronner sees insurmountable threats to human survival, runaway population, obliterative war, plus exhaustion of the environment. He believes the only curve in sight to be the Malthusian crisis of famine and disease. He sees another disturbing prospect. An approaching danger of underdeveloped countries is shaking newly obtained atomic bombs in nuclear blackmail to secure massive redistribution of the world's wealth. We now face convulsive change forced upon us by breakdown and catastrophe wherein future survival is at stake and may be possible only under some super government capable of rallying obedience far more effectively than would be possible in a democratic setting. Is the stage being set for a super government to be headed by a brilliant world leader? Will he be the Antichrist? Paul Henry Spock, former Prime Minister of Belgium and a leader of the Council of Europe, once issued a statement that further amplified the world's cries for some super statesman to surface. We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass in which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and he be God or the devil. We will receive him. The Bible prophesizes that Antichrist will surface, and he will fit Spock's description above perfectly. The Edge Dr. Arnold Toynbee, an eminent British historian and philosopher, said, The world now stands on the edge of an abyss. I see little prospect of humanity writing itself to avoid some kind of a cataclysmic crash. Dr. Billy Graham says, The world is now facing a crisis of such proportions that our whole civilization is threatened. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Romans chapter 8 verse 22 On a smaller scale, humanity is now functioning with but a thin veneer of decency. People no longer blush at even the grossest sin. The world seems poised in expectancy of new troubles. Yes, our world is groaning for rescue, holding its breath for some momentous happening. There is great restlessness and a jockeying for power among the nations of the world. Israel and the oil-rich Middle East still perform an especially macabre dance about the world's power button. Managing the affairs between the nations has become a virtual impossibility. Every institution created to promote international harmony has flopped. The frustrating impotency of the United Nations in the Balkans underscores the failure of man's best efforts. In the last days, it is said that there will be distress and perplexities of nations. See Luke chapter 21 verse 25. Angry masses all around the globe are highly ignitable. They seem itching to fight, to steal, and to destroy. Ethnic cleansing has entered a language as a euphemism for murdering or driving out every member of a powerless minority. Incendiary speeches of the revolutionaries and the terrorists incite violence and war. The concerted efforts of the evil prince of this world catapult our planet into its death throes. The thoughts of the late chairman Mao Zedong inspired a violent slogan. Power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Those kidnapped by terrorists and thugs incur millions in ransom. New political kidnappings break out everywhere like some dark plague. Brutality, terror, and murder stalk the people of every nation. In California, a long list has been found naming people marked for death or kidnapping by terrorist groups. School children take revenge on their tormentors with automatic weapons. No wonder the Bible said that in the last days, men's hearts would fail them for fear. A recent newspaper editorial revealed a direct correlation between alcohol consumption and the crisis climate. Breweries and drug peddlers are having a field day selling their reality-blurring potions to sinners who are trying to escape the consequences of their lives. 
The Pale Horse. Some years ago, British author C.P. Snow wrote, Perhaps in 10 years, millions of people in the poor countries are going to starve to death before our eyes. We shall see them doing so upon our television sets. But how soon? How many? These are the most important questions in our world today. When Snow sounded this apocalyptic warning, his hearers dismissed it as unduly alarmist. But Americans have been shocked and dismayed as TV cameras have panned across refuge camps in Rwanda, Sudan, and Uganda, showing thousands of hollow-eyed, bloated, and starving people. God's book foretold famine galloping through the earth. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Revelation chapter 6 verse 8 Planet Earth has put up with so much from us. Rather than being good stewards of the earth, we have polluted it, sucked its treasures dry, and abused it in 10,000 ways. It has nourished its billions of heaven-defying passengers. But a time of reckoning quickly approaches. Earth needs and will soon get its millennium respite. Even 2,000 years ago, Paul could hear the clock ticking. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. Present realities depress the drifting masses of today, but to each believer they are Bible prophecies tolling an end to world corruption and joyously ringing in that rapturous day. Good news in the wind. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16-17 through 17.